Okay, so I'm going to admit it. I didn't think we'd be talking about zero trust with this density of focus, or frankly, possibly at all, here in 2024, or riding into 2025 with it being a major implementation focus of security leaders. Zero Trust has been around for years. I remember learning about it kind of partway through my career as this interesting academic model of how you might better structure networks, applications, and business architecture to be able to detect and defend and contain attacks. The problem was the way it was described, whilst it was elegant and a cool set of principles, was just so far from the way that any network was implemented, couldn't really ever see it happening. So it's kind of in that cool idea, academic notion kind of bank for me within my brain. Now, of course, as a reference model, that's a little unfair because people did start to take good ideas from it and apply some of the stuff. But I never had this idea that Zero Trust would have the focus that it does today. So I love being wrong, it's fascinating. Let me start just very briefly with a little primer on Zero Trust and then why I think it's become so important. And finally, a few things you need to think about if you are going to engage in this type of project over the next couple of years as a security leader, if you're considering investments in these areas. Zero Trust is the idea that we take our very monolithic networks and application designs and micro-segment them, we break them down to be able to have generically better containment and continuous authorization, continuous checks and balances as we traverse through a network or an application or data. That was, okay, admittedly, maybe a little bit dry. Let me make it a bit more fun. Rolo chocolates. I love a Rolo chocolate. I'm not allowed them anymore. I'm watching my waistline. But when I was, Rolo chocolates have a hard outer shell and they're soft and gooey on the inside. What I love about that analogy is exactly how most people's networks are architected. There's this kind of outer layer, but once you're in, it's easy to traverse between different systems and resources and data. On average, employees tend to have way more access to information than they ought to. So if an attacker is able to breach a system, moving laterally around the environment is a lot easier than it should be. And of course, forget that as well, monitoring those actions to identify that a breach has occurred is also significantly harder for the security team. They're dealing with this morass of network interactions, many of which may be business legitimate. And within some, there may be some attacker activities they have to detect. So with Zero Trust, instead of having this one massive giant Rolo chocolate that's soft and gooey on the inside, we have lots of little Rolo chocolates. We have different little pods of applications and data, implementations of the principle of need to know. So when someone joins, I define their job role and I define which of those areas they need to have access to. As I move into that little micro segment to do my work at the boundary, I'm validated, I'm authenticated, I'm checked against a profile to make sure that I should be there and I have the right to do so. So instead of being flat and open, I now have this much more kind of generically monitorable and micro-segmented structure. It's a novel implementation. Now, of course, at the outset, you probably notice some of the challenges. Firstly, I have to take my network that is conventionally defined and I have to break it up into those smaller blocks, which means I need to engage in understanding what those things are, how they work, what business policies are applied and the roles of people in my organization it's a lot harder to write those policies than the traditional kind of lazy approach to network architecture and generic access lists and user management. It's work. And of course, different segments might have different technologies. So it's not like I'm necessarily implementing all this stuff in the same stack necessarily. But therefore, if it's so hard, why are we talking about this stuff now? More than 10 years after this became cool, why the obsession here for the next couple of years for security leaders? Well, a lot of it is a direct response to what's happening on the threat side, the cyber criminals over the last few years. One of the most popular campaign types has been ransomware. The attackers dropping into a network, hitting a system, spreading out, 
encrypting data and preventing you from accessing information. A highly effective strategy. You could find hospitals or industrial control systems locked out of things that have a life and limb impact. Or you could hit an accountancy firm and lock up all of their data stores, encrypting it so that the only way they can get their data back is of course by going to the attacker and paying them money. Now this campaign of ransomware has been much loved by the cyber criminals for, for many, many years. A huge portion of my career, it's been attractive because unlike stealing credit cards, with data, everybody cares about their data. It's the ultimate ubiquitous attack for the cyber criminals that almost always has a payoff. Of course, we've been campaigning in the security industry around people having backups and being able to restore and good resilience plans. Now, as that's paid off more, people are able to restore their data, making ransomware less effective. Rather than paying the cyber criminals, you just run through the restore process. That means that cyber criminals have moved on to new tactics like extortionware. So instead of encrypting your data, they steal it. They sit in the background, siphon it away, and then they publish your business name and website on a public web page and say, at this date, I will publish this information or this portion of the information I stole from you. Your IP for your new video game or patient records that will get you in trouble with the regulator, whatever it may be. It's a brilliant evolution of the threat. As a side, it also has the benefit they don't necessarily get in trouble with causing life and limb disruption by encrypting systems, just stealing the data instead. And some cyber criminal campaigns do both. The viability of extortionware and ransomware and similar is because people are able to access way too much information. They get into employee X's system who should have this much stuff and they're able to spread out throughout the network and cause much more damage or steal much more data than they should. Zero trust, micro segmentation, having continuous monitoring, continuous authentication, and the ability to lock down is of course therefore a fantastic defense and containment and detection strategy. That's why the stuff has become more popular. But again, these trends have been happening for a while, so why the resurgence now? Well, I think there's one additional element that's particularly interesting here. A lot of the technologies that we are now using are just better at implementing zero trust. If I'm trying to do zero trust in a traditional networked business environment compared to a stack in the cloud, it's just much easier. Those cloud consoles have central reporting and setup. I have code-based ability to define micro segments, much more flexible software-defined networking, continuous authorization capabilities. It's just much easier to implement a concept like zero trust in an environment with that level of flexibility and control. We've been through a pandemic where many businesses rapidly accelerated, probably to the scale of years, their deployment of cloud-based technologies, regrettably in some cases accelerating them beyond their present capabilities of the security team in a bit of a panic. And as a result though, we have way more technology deployed capable of zero trust. So I love this. Against my predictions, thinking this was going to be crusty and a reference model to be used in textbooks. This is stuff that's actually getting implemented and prioritized by security leaders over the coming years for these many benefits. If you haven't read much about it, now's the time to do so. Now, I don't want to provide a complete zero trust implementation guide here. Um, it would take a long time and I can't, but I want to give you a few principles to think about as you evaluate this technology trend. The first is, Whilst this is an excellent containment defense detection strategy, it's more work. Responsibly defining the roles, the principle of need to know, who has to have access to what, is significantly harder than how we traditionally built our networks. You need resources. It is hard to build this type of setup at any reasonable pace without disrupting a business if you don't have an adequate supply of network engineers, cloud engineers, security engineers, and the ability to interface with the business and roles to learn what people need. It's intensive. 
On a second scale, we also need the specialist skills to be able to implement these policies. You're going to use cloud technologies more comprehensively than just firing up Azure or AWS and deploying a few instances. You're gonna use this stuff much more aggressively. So you need specialist cloud security skills and networking skills to be able to do that well. One might argue that's what we ought to be doing anyway, but it's gonna be particularly pertinent to zero trust. The next is it's a longer term transformation project. It won't happen overnight because you built a policy. In fact, it should be steady state and managed carefully to avoid undue business disruption that may cause it to be rolled back. It is going to be a bit of a longer transformation. So think about having enough of the right skills in the right density, specializing in these areas that can implement it, and building a plan with a high level architecture and a roadmap for implementation. But if you achieve this, the dividends that you will be paid in generic detection and defensibility are going to be very significant for the years to come. And not just in ransomware and extortionware, but across all manner of different types of threats and attacker tactics that may evolve. So I think this is worth the investment. I think it's worth the focus, but it is something that requires significant attention. And if I could share one last thought with you on why now, from talking to lots of CISOs and security leaders, it's only getting harder. Our networks grow larger, we have more systems, we have more data, we have more applications. We have other disruptive technology trends like AI, we have more attacker motives. The direction of travel is bigger. If we don't start now working on this surface area, we're digging the hole quite literally significantly deeper to be able to try to tackle this in the years to come, where it will only grow more difficult and more expensive. So as one security leader said to me from a large bank, why not now? <laughs>